Geisha Verfel is a visual artist as well as a teaching assistant professor here at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, Geisha received an MFA in studio art from UNC, as well as an MA in photography and urban cultures from Goldsmiths at the University of London, as well as a diploma in spatial planning from the Technical University of Dortmund in Germany. Her work has been exhibited, published, and awarded internationally. Um, exhibition venues include the Tate Modern, Goldsmiths, University of London, Corner House, Manchester, Center for Photography at Woodstock, Contemporary Art Museum here in Raleigh, CAM, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, as well as the Kokerei Zollverein in Germany. And that's just a few. Um, we can add the Nasher to that and UNC campus and all different places. Griffin is the author of Basement Sanctuaries, um, which was published in 2014 by Schlitt. Her work has been published in the New York Times, The Guardian, Wired, Slate, and many other outlets. She has received several grants, um, as well from the Puffin Foundation, UNC Chapel Hill, including from the Center for European Studies. She received a um, grant from us for, to travel to the EU, three different countries to take photos, and we will uh, see some of that today. She's received funding from the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council as well. Um, and she's been given many awards. For example, um, in 2015, 2017, she was a top 50 critical mass winner. Um, she is currently represented by the Tracy Morgan Gallery. She'll tell us a little bit more about that soon. Um, she's going to talk to us about the work that she does on both sides of the Atlantic, um, looking at different, um, through her lens, she's looking at different parts of the US and European history. And um, it's really quite fascinating. I'm really glad that she will share it with us today. Thank you, Geisha, for being here. Thank you, Katie, for the introduction. and. Welcome everybody. I'm glad you're joining us here today. Um, I will first talk a little bit about my background and then I will talk about one project, um, oppressive architecture for which I've been photographing both in, Ger in, yeah, in Germany and Poland, um, the, Czech, the Czech Republic and the US. And um, with time I will also talk about a more recent project um, it's called What Remains of the Day Memories of World War II. And for this project, I, I received funding from the Center for European Studies and Jewish Studies and uh, Art and Art History. So I will well, switch to my presentation now. So I will disappear. Let me just, so you will see this. And when, yeah, and I will appear again when we um, come to the uh, Q&A session. So as Katie said, I have a background in urban planning, visual sociology, and also art. And I, I was born and raised in Germany. I've lived in the UK for a few years and moved to the U US in, in 2009. And in my work, I investigate the relationship humans have with their environment and urban places and in landscapes. And um, in, I, my photos engage with the socio-political implications of um, spatial processes uh, by exploring the notions of geography, history, race, class, and gender. And as you will see in my work, um, most photos don't um, show people, but really they talk about the traces that people have left behind using these spaces or pa passing through the spaces. And I'm normally drawn to unusual, derelict, mundane, and often overlooked spaces. Um, and also my practice is research-based, um, which enables me not only to place my work into an art back ground or artistic fear but also beyond. So um, it's really that through my background as an urban planner, sociologist and artist, I explore spaces and structures, for example, like in this oppressive architecture project, by analyzing um, the places and structures for particular attributes. I look at what kind of buildings there are streets, infrastructure, and also why people will have used the spaces, what kind of interactions are visible. I mean, not only in, in this work, but in, in all of my work. 
and um, by using my photographer's eye, I compose images often with a strong leaning towards architectural photography, um, which is visible in the formal lines, um, the analytical way um, which I use to frame my images. So in the ar oppressive architecture project, I um, I look at the relationship between architecture and op oppression during the histori historical eras of um, American slavery and German Nazism. This project is also work in progress, so I will talk a bit more about it at the end, what um, other oppressive architectural structures I want to focus on in the future. So the idea for this project really um, was sparked um, by a conversation I had with uh, Professor William Ferris, who used to be the director of the Center for the American South at UNC, and who retired um, last year. And um, we talked about the role that architecture plays in our society and also the various purposes architecture can be used for. So I developed the idea to look um, to take a closer look at the architecture of oppression, um, as I said, during German Nazism and American slavery. So I will first show the, the images from Germany. And um, so I was interested in how the Nazi regime in my home country, Germany, applied architecture to spread terror. And I looked at the different purposes for which buildings were erected and on the one hand we can see for example the concentration labor and death camps that were built for the degradation or humiliation humiliation sorry of of certain groups of people who who didn't you know fit into the system and they were used for eliminating and killing thousands millions of people and then on the other hand, uh, I quickly skip through and then go back, we will also see, um, yeah, the propaganda buildings, like the Nazi party rally grounds in Nuremberg that were used for marches, propaganda, showmanship and display. And then we can really see a difference also in the, the architectural styles that were selected. And this is also um, the colonnade of the Congress Hall the Nazi party rally grounds. So these are very monumental and impressive buildings. And um, in this case, they used limestone on the, on the outside. This is what the inside looks like. It was never finished, this building. And um, the Congress Hall was supposed to have, I think, three times the size of the Colosseum in Rome. And on the other hand, we can see like the barracks um, in the camps that were built of you know very simple wood and um, yeah so I, we can see a huge difference in style um, and um, so based on my background as in urban planning I was interested in how the Nazis approached spatial architectural and urban planning issues and how by using particular tools they accomplished certain goals. So this for example is um, the architectural camp model of Sachsenhausen which is um, outside Berlin and whereas Dachau in, near Munich was the first official MSA camp, this is um, the first camp that was planned by the Nazis and this the camp model was based on the panopticon so the overseer would be in the building you can see where the nine is placed and the overseer would be able to see everything that was going on in that camp so the, could, uh, the person the overseer would see every barrack every person who um, was walking around and later on there's another section, I think it says 14, that was added for um, the Russian prisoners. And then like the model of the overseeing eye wasn't possible anymore because that was basically too far away. 
Um, so this is was taken from the overseers of um I took the image um from the tower and and nine to and was able to oversee the whole camp. So I also took images to the left and right, but you only see uh one section right now. And in total, um, I photographed, I think by now is it 12 or 13 camps. So this past summer I went to um, the former concentration camp in um, Terezin and also photographed the Jewish ghetto there. And then I also visited Stutthof in Poland. And um, yeah, so I've, I, in these camps, I documented the uh, inhumane conditions that prisoners had to live and labor in. I mean, of course, right now we only see the remains and a few of or most of these buildings are replicas so that the visitor has an idea what it would have looked like in the 1930s and 40s when the prisoners were forced to live and labor in these camps. And I photographed the barracks, the camp kitchen, um, the remains of the architecture, the interior spaces, the um, latrines, the toilets, um, but then also the landscape and the way that the architecture gets incorporated in the landscape especially if you remember the very first image of the Plossenburg prison, where we only see the foundation of it, but no longer the, the prison architecture. And then you can also see the difference in architecture between an overseer's house in Ravensbrück. So they lived on the hill, on top of the hill and um, surrounded by trees that um, they wouldn't have to look at the camp. And on the other hand, uh, this was again the um, the overseer's um, um, yeah building where they could oversee every part of the camp. So the the Ravensbrück concentration camp was extended to the left side, and Ravensbrück was um, a camp mostly for women and uh, and children. So we've talked about the Congress Hall and the Nazi Party rally grounds. And then another structure I photographed is the heavy load bearing body in Berlin or the Schwerbelastungskörper um, that was built in, if I remember correctly, in 19, they started building it in 1938. And, you may be familiar with the um, the plans that Hitler had to make Berlin the capital of um, Germania. And um, so his yeah, favorite architect, Albert Speer, um, had plans for Berlin and he wanted to build a triumph arch three times the size of the Arc de Triomphe. And um, this is in at the border of Schöneberg, Tempelhof and Kreuzberg, where the train uh, tracks go to the new Hauptbahnhof. And um, so they had to, wanted to test whether the soil in Berlin would withheld that massive structure. So the structure extends for 14 meters into the ground and about 40 meters above ground. And because the war started, they were ne never able to finish the, the Triumph Arch. So this is what remains and because as you can see on the right there's a red building it's it's very close to apartment buildings they were never able to demolish it so it is a site that can be visited in berlin now and um i also had an exhibition there in 2016 that was organized by the museum tempelhof schoneberg and i showed the oppressive architecture project there which i thought was a really good venue for the work so that was the outside and then also inside. 
And I've also shown this work most recently at um, Green Hill in Greensboro. And it was also shown at uh, Cam Raleigh in 2016. So um, the small study of concentration camp architecture is um, yeah, a sub-project of oppressive architecture. And I photographed um, the remaining camp architecture always um, with the same settings. So with a wide lens and also a symmetrically framed photograph the front of the structure and uh, they were all taken at half of the structure's height. And by photographing the buildings from the view same viewpoint and distance, um, one is able to see similarities and differences between the structures. So I'm only showing you a selection now, I have more. And um, I photographed some more this past summer. I still have to spend time scanning because most of my work is I photograph, no, I use film and um, so I have to scan my work and then it becomes digital. And see. And this is an installation at uh, Cam Raleigh in 2016 of that project. So I, as I mentioned before, I not only photographed in Europe, but I also photographed in um, the United States. And I was interested in here, um, looking at how architecture was used um, yeah, to oppress um, the slaves that were brought from Africa to labor on um, the American uh, the southern plantations. And I'm, with this project, I document the relationship again between yeah, architecture and oppression, and I photograph architectural structures in a cross section of places, I think except for one, all of the structures I photographed um, are based in North Carolina. So this one, you may not know the story, but it's uh, from the Hargraves plantation. And this is now in the North Carolina Botanical Garden. And where the Hargraves plantation um, is in the, like the Davy Circle area and um, Glenwood, uh, no, Glendale and further down up to, um, to uh, 54. And Paul Green, the famous writer, he built a house next to, uh, on the property of where the plantation house would have been. And this, he converted this former slave cabin into his writing cabin. And that was then transferred to the North Carolina Botanical Gardens. But in the gardens, we don't see any reference to the slaves or the plantation. So it's only, there's a sign that just talks about poor green. And um, so with this project, I examine the inhumane ways that slaves were forced to live in labor on the Southern plantations um, with commodity production, human reproduction and social um, repression. So I photographed, I think so far about 10 11 plantations, but the process is a lot more difficult um, to find than in Germany because, as you probably know, um, well, not many slave cabins have been preserved. It was always the big house, and um, so it is quite difficult to find the slave cabins. And uh, there is um, the slave cabin project sorry, this slave dwelling project. And Joseph McGill um, is a historian. He tries to sleep in every existing slave cabin in, in the US. So I've, um, I have a long list of plantations I could visit, but um, because they're often far away, it is a bit of a challenge to get there. And then I also, um, I photograph the places when the sun sets and also use strobes 
to illuminate the buildings and so I always have to travel with an assistant and um, I also prefer to go like between October and um, March when there are no snakes out and the ticks are hopefully gone and um, and what I have to say I found it um, very shocking to see how in comparison to Germany the um, the past has been preserved here only like a partial it is mostly the history of the white people that's being talked about but not about the African Americans and, and the slaves and um, so with both both of these projects I um, I really want to explore and also yeah um, ask the viewer like yeah how these structures continue to influence the contemporary landscape its inhabitants and also our understanding of history and um, I think it's also important to recognize the historic value of all these structures and then uh, one of the question is like how and if architecture can be used to com uh, commemorate and maybe also reconcile a, con a country's past. I mean, that's maybe something also you can answer. And in the future, I would like to continue with, with this project and also photograph um, Japanese American internment camps and also Native American reservations and a more contemporary well, yes, issue is also the camps on the US-Mexico border. I think they would also fit into this project and also the US prison system. So as you see, this is the work in progress and I need to find funding now to continue working on this project. Um, let me see. So I think we still have some time, right? Um, I can talk about a more recent project, um, what remains of the day memories of World War II. That project explores the history of World War II and the Holocaust. And it was really while working on the oppressive architecture project that I was thinking, like, how can I, yeah, visualize memories? And um, I then had the idea that I could overexpose the images for one second for every year since World War II has ended. And so these are really long exposures. Um, in 2016, that was a 71 second exposure, uh, overexposure. And that's why the image looks as it does, it looks very faded and similar to our memories. Um, memories are not often very clear. They're faded sometimes in color, they exist in color and sometimes in black and white. And very often we don't even remember. And um, so I photographed places uh, where Nazi atrocities were planned or carried out. Like, for example, here the House of the Wannsee Conference, where the final solution to the Jewish question was decided. I think it's a very, very important place for this project, but also, of course, a very horrible one. This one is the Jewish ghetto in Terezin that I photographed last summer. And um, see, then Auschwitz. And then this is the Piaszczyca forest in Poland that I also photographed last year where <clears throat> The mass shootings of the Polish intelligentsia, but also Jews and mentally ill from um, yeah, like that yeah, the German um, Reich were brought here and were killed. I also um, visited the D-Day beaches and Atlantic War fortifications. So you can see the image in my background, Normandy. 
and also when I came up with the idea for this project, it was in 2016 when um, uh, the refugees from mostly from Syria, but also Afghanistan and Iraq um, came to Germany. And I was wondering if um, Germany and, and um, Angela Merkel let in a um, million of refugees into Germany. So I was wondering if Germans, because based on our past, we have a responsibility to also show if we're, that we can be human. So and I think it was a really great step by her to welcome all the refugees. But um, I mean, we have seen the backlash for this in Germany and also many other Eastern European countries where now and anti-Semitic and also uh, xenophobic sentiments have risen. And um, the photos really encourage the viewers to think about the horrors of fascism and World War II and how they are still relevant today. Because when we talk about memories, um, I think it also seemed important to me to talk to people who lived through that time. So I have inter viewed and portrayed um, 22 witnesses of the war. Some of them are Holocaust survivors. I interviewed one US Army veteran and also Germans who supported Hitler, but also Germans who um, were either Holocaust survivors or had to suffer from persecution. So I interviewed Doris Krosna uh, Dovichova last summer in, um, in Prague and she was a young a girl when she was in, sent to a Jewish ghetto in Terezin and in Terezin she was one of um, three female shepherds so she had to tend to the sheep she also worked in agriculture before, before she became a shepherd, but um, she thinks really that's what saved her. She was able to be outside all the time and she got more food um, than the other the prisoners in the ghetto. And very sadly, she died about six weeks after I interviewed her last year. And so that's why you can see all the sheep, everybody who meets her gives her a sheep. And um, Barbara Ledermann, she had to uh, emigrate with her family from Berlin to Amsterdam and where she became friends with um, the Anne Frank family. So she was friends with the older sister of Anne Frank. And um, Barbara had a, a boyfriend who was in the Dutch underground and he got her false papers. And so she um, left her family um, and um, she always tried to convince her parents that it, they would also give her sister, younger sister, false papers so that she could also go into hiding with her. Um, but then her parents thought her sister was too young, so they um, wouldn't let her go. And then uh, very sadly, they were uh, deported to Westerbork same as um, the Anne Frank family. And um, Barbara survived and she, spend like weeks procuring food for other Jews that were hidden in Amsterdam. She, um, she got the food and put it in a, um, um, a small cart that was covered by clothes or something else and then she just distributed um, food and she lives in Chapel Hill now. Oh, she's been living here for many years and um, B.T. Phillips um, he um, is a U.S. Army veteran who fought who fought in um, in Normandy. So he arrived I think about a month after the D-Day landings and then fought in in Normandy and Luxembourg and Germany. And he was on the boat back to the U.S. the day when the bomb was dropped in uh, Hiroshima. So he talks about that too. And then Walter Sultzen, um, his father was a minister and um, he was a minister, the 
the German church was split and the one part of the church um, supported Hitler and the other one, the other side, it was called the Bekennende Kirche, um, was against Hitler. And so his father wasn't allowed to work anymore. And um, he was then deported to Dachau and killed as many, um, yeah, uh, pastors or priests were. So Walter and his brother, they survived the war. He even circumvened being called into the service of the Hitler Jugend. So he managed to stay out and um, he was later uh, considered a victim of fascism. And what is interesting, so both um, Walter Sülten and also Werner Höfner, they were based in Berlin. So you can also hear the stories from them. So after the war, when Berlin was divided, the four sector city, and then even when the Berlin Wall came, was erected. So you also hear the story. There are stories of how the history of Germany continued after the war. And Werner Höpfner, he was in the Hitler Youth in Berlin and uh, at age 14, he was deported to Russia for eight and a half years for forced labor in the Gulag, which he survived. And also very sadly, he has passed away in February. And um, I had an exhibition with this work, I guess, in 2018 and 2019 at the Pensacola Museum of Art. And um, this, the, I think the 21 portraits, yeah. And the project was also exhibited at Green Hill in North Carolina. And I also made a sound installation um, with four of the interviews that was presented at the exhibitions where we can hear for witnesses of the war talk about their work, uh, about their life and their work. So two of them speak in German, two in English. And um, I think yeah, three, three of them are Holocaust survivors. And one is, yeah, Werner Hefner who talks about his life. And I was also, so that's it about my work so far, but I was also thinking you've, heard that everybody is suffering right now during the COVID um, pandemic and especially like artists, musicians, um, uh, so visual artists, performing artists, musicians. And so the Orange County Arts, uh, the Orange County Arts Commission, Commission has created um, an art support fund. So if anybody would be willing to donate something, then the money gets distribu distributed to the arts community and um, also Visual Arts Exchange in Bali has set up a similar fund for artists. So yeah, thank you. And then if you want, you can look at my website or at Tracy Morgan Gallery. She's based in Asheville, North Carolina.